Later, I was asked, asked to join the organizing team of this uh, campaign, known as the Helsinki Chronicle. And that was sort of where I started making a LARP in a more of a serious way. Serious, 18 years old, very serious at that time. And, uh, but that was the thing, as part of this uh, big uh, Finnish, we had a team of 10 people making, making vampire LARPs. And uh, another thing I did in this prehistory of my personal LARP, which I mentioned because it becomes relevant later, <coughs> is I did a few experimental LARPs of, uh, in set in this world of darkness, of games like Vampire the Masquerade, Changeling the Dreaming and so on. We did a Changeling the Dreaming LARP at my high school, where everybody played like fucked up versions of themselves as fairies. And then another thing we, I did was a random generated vampire LARP where uh, you take up all the elements that make up a character and as we all know those elements are your disciplines, your nature, your demeanor, <coughs> none of this history stuff. Okay, we did have a small history generator too, which had a bug because of, and so about half had fathers who were taxi drivers because of that bug in the generator. Random generated vampire LARP. And then I tried to make a sequel for that because I noticed in the random generated vampire LARP and this becomes relevant at the end of this talk I noticed that uh, you can break up the characters into little pieces that are, uh, can be remixed into holes I tried to make a sequel where instead of nature and demeanor and potence three dots you would have little text blocks that would then be remixed into a character based on this random process but we never made that because I don't think I was uh, smart enough to do it at that point. So, I think this is the first LARP that I think is, uh, that I, I made, or was one of the people who made it, it is good enough that I'm comfortable putting it up here on a slide. It's 2004. I was a mature 24-year-old LARP organizer, but at this point, and uh, this game was designed by myself and Mika Pohjola, who sits right there. And the thankless job of producing it fell to Mikko Pervila. Uh, the funny thing about this LARP is that uh, it was designed to prove one point. And that point was that LARPs can be art. And I had a very utilitarian view of how you do that. Because I thought that if people look at the video of this LARP and they think, that sure looks like art. <laughs> then, it's art. <laughs> and, uh, because you can have this theoretical discussion about this stuff, but I don't think you can win that discussion in the sense that you can truly convince every last skeptic on earth that yes, it's art. But I was in art school at the time in uh, northern France, and uh, I felt that if I take a video of this game, to my school and just show it around. And if people react like I think they will react, then it's art. And it's gonna work. And I think that history has proven it to be successful in this regard. <coughs> Even if I say so myself. <laughs> the kind of core idea, but there's some other ideas here too. That uh, The core idea in this game was that uh, there's uh, a group of cancer patients who are in this group therapy to get into the grips, to get into grips with the fact that they are all dying. So with death. And uh, the physical environment consisted of 800 kilos of uh, flour. So the stuff you use to make bread. You see it in there. These photos are very unclear. Documentation was not big in 2004, unfortunately. But, uh, but uh, the idea that uh, to use the flower, the flower is on the floor, you walk in it, you're half naked. And the idea for this is uh, that where this came from was that I wanted to make, or we wanted to make a game there where there's a kind of an element of uh, like physical pleasure. And it feels nice, it feels good. And I think this idea of physically enjoyable LARP activity is, is actually a very old one, a very classic one. It goes to, I mean, what's the stereotypical LARP? The stereotypical LARP is where you have a buffer sword and hit, it, hit people with it. That's fun. 
I think that's physically fun. It's fun to go around doing that, beating people with that sword. This is sort of the same, except, you know, with flower. So, that was, those were the cancer patients, flower, physical feeling of the flower. You can check out the flower yourself by buying a, some flower and sticking your hand in it. It feels nice. It feels even better when it's on your body. So that was the, that was the sort of uh, thinking behind it. But of course, what proved the art point was just like a video where you don't understand any of this. <laughs> uh, here you also, when, you, when it's hot, there's flower, you're naked, sweat. You get it. <laughs> the one I tried to choose, like uh, of these games that I talk about more, uh, one or two design points from each that I think are interesting. Uh, some of them were things that uh, at least we invented at the time, maybe other people invented too, others we just uh, grabbed from somewhere. For uh, luminescence, I think the most practical, widely applicable rule is the rule of normality, which we used to explain away the flower. The design problem was this. If you are in your underwear standing in flower and you get no other instructions, there's a very natural thing that you start doing, which is you stand with your fellow players and you start the conversation, so how about this flower? Weird, huh? And that conversation is extremely boring. It is that you need to accelerate past this con conversation. If that conversation is happening, then the game is stalling, it's not interesting. If people are just, <laughs> we want them to just engage with the flower. Treat it as it's something normal. And that's the point of the rule of normality, is that, uh, is to just say that the flower is totally in-game, you are really, it's not like an off-game, it's not meta-game flower. In this cancer therapy, it's totally normal to do this like this. None of, your, none of your characters will find this unusual in any way. And that is why you don't talk about it, because it's normal. Instead, you just sort of use it for whatever purpose. <laughs> and I think this can be used in many different LARPs. I think the normal thing that you would do is to say, let's say that it's off game, or something like that. But I think often the rule of normality makes it easier to kind of incorporate it into your, your LARP headspace. So that uh, you can work with it. And I think here it worked very well in the sense that people engaged, they had flower fights and a lot of stuff like that. Another funny thing about this LARP is that I, it has almost, I think, become like a LARP meme, almost. That when I see some uh, discussions about LARP somewhere outside my sphere, they think, yeah, the cancer patient LARP, the flower. And it's fun. Another game I did at that time is, called, is this one called Alaste Elementary School. Which, about, which is about bullying. It's like a bullying simulator, basically. But uh, I don't mean to say that in a flippant way, but we basically, what, what I just wanted to do was to make a game where bullying works as I myself remember it from you know, childhood. That's bullying in action. I mentioned this because there's one uh, thing that here was very effective. <coughs> the game was set during like a school day, so it's structured around like a period where you sit teacher is there, you are doing schoolwork, a 15 minute break, and another, and this is repeated, I think five, four, five times. Period, break, period, break. And that resulted in a, in a LARP effect, which was that everybody sort of sits in class, gathering steam, coming up with ideas, and they're sitting there, and the teacher is going blah, 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 and everybody in class is sort of, uh, sort of, they're a little bit engaging with each other, they are, exchanging glances, someone, somebody passing notes, and when the period comes, bam, everybody runs outside, 15 minutes of horrible action, they come back in, they stew, they stew, they gather energy, they gather energy, run outside, action, 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 and then back in. That was actually a completely accidental in the sense that uh, I didn't plan it like that, it's just, just like a school day structured like that, sort of realistically. So that's where it came from, but I felt that it was actually very effective to have that uh, extremely hard hierarchy of time in the LARP. So, next one. Uh, like normally when you have these program items where uh, the idea is that, you know, come to talk about your greatest mistakes and your most like flawed LARPs that uh, were horrible, horrible catastrophes. I always pick this one normally. Uh, it's called I Regret Nothing. 
uh, this joke, I told it all, all the time, never gets old. But, uh, and I made it uh, with uh, Mikke Pohjola and Eric Flatland, 2006. I think there is a kind of a creative uh, fallacy in all kinds of creative work. And it goes like this. If I can make something that's really good and wonderful by making a huge amount of effort, putting really a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of creativity into it. If I can do that, then I can, the next time I do, it, I do it, I can do it just sort of by waving my hand. Somehow I forget the idea that it actually took a lot of work. I don't know why, but I forget that. And, and I don't think I'm the only one who has made this mistake. That the second time around you sort of imagine that, yeah, it was easy. And then you realize that you are in the organizer room of a LARP with players coming tomorrow and you don't really have things like characters or an, like an understanding of what's the world of the game <laughs> or really, really anything. But what you do have is uh, a lot of wow things, things that are quite spectacular and a couple of really neat game design ideas and, uh, and, a, and an in-game radio station that this actually works. Like it was play, played in a shopping mall, you had a radio, you could tune in it. It was, uh, so, so we had all of those things, but those things don't really replace LARP, but they make a fun story. Uh, there was one, I, I was the one who took the radio, like we had a small radio transmitter, we went to a pizza place, we tell the pizza guys, can we leave our transmitter here in your pizza place? <laughs> and they said, yes, 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 of course, of course. But what I didn't know is that they also tuned their own radio to our radio station and broadcast it inside their... Uh, uh, pizzeria. And when I, when I noticed that they were doing it, I, I sort of went up to them and said, guys, guys, I know that right now what you're hearing is the uh, Sweet Dreams Marathon with all the different cover versions of the song, but what's going to come up next is not something you want to play here in your uh, pizza parlor because it's all this necrophilia stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and they went, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, we you know, support you guys, it's great. And then when I came there the next time, they had switched to another channel, and uh, but they didn't mention it anymore. But they were still nice to, uh, to us after that. But there was one design idea. There's a little, one of our players. One of our ideas was to stick the logo on everything, including the baby. Uh, there's another place where we stuck the logo. Urban space, you know. But the, I think the good design idea here, the thing that's, I think, the simplest, best, clearest thing that also worked in this LARP is simply about how to distribute your resources in the LARP. What we had in this LARP was an underground ice hockey stadium, which we acquired to our use in a very random way. We were scouting the area with a, a guide from the art festival, and uh, there were uh, these uh, ventilation exo exhaust ports on the ground. And Mika very wisely asked our guide, like, why are those ventilation exhaust ports so huge? Like, what are they ventilating? And the guide says, yeah, it's around the ground ice hockey stadium. <laughs> That's what they're ventilating. And then Mika asks our guide, can we have that? <laughs> and, and this is where, uh, and of course, yes, was the answer. Yes, of course you can have it. Just you need to call, call the caretaker and the caretaker will like give you the keys because uh, <laughs> like it works with the trust system. And that, that was actually how it, how it went down. I was very surprised by this, but it was a great wow effect to have this underground cavern thing. The opening image here is actually the entrance to the um, underground cavern thing. But the way we used it, and I think that is, is, is about, if you have a magnificent location, do you set the entire LARP in the magnificent location or the last 20 minutes of the LARP in the <laughs> magnificent location? And the point of doing sort of the wow effect is to use it only at the end. So you save all of your best stuff for great moments of like, oh, it's amazing. And that's the sort of uh, goal of this type of design, is that you <laughs> waste a huge amount of resources into making something really, really, really memorable. But that effect, I think, here works very nicely, that you get into grips with the LARP's normal design in, a, in a one environment that's not so spectacular in, in this sense, the suburban environment, and then you go from there underground Wow, huge. I mean, the, the world of the game expands suddenly into this uh, massive thing. So, next up, another game in 2008. Here we come back to 
also it was in luminescence this idea of uh, what's fun to do what's pleasurable to do like just physically do really really simple stuff and of course breaking shit is great i mean we uh, I, I i don't know about you i love it but unfortunately life gives so few opportunities to go nuts with that stuff so that was the idea here uh, it was a game about uh, like uh, settling an inheritance in a, in a large family. And of course, there's all kinds of tensions. And we had a couple of hundred of these uh, ceramic cups. And the idea was that every time, the game mechanic was that every time you express emotion, you express it by smashing one of those into the ground. Every emotion. Love, <coughs> smash it. Hate, <laughs> smash it. And uh, very simple stuff. So basic, and, and of course, the inheritance stuff is just to give you something to have emotions about. That's not so serious that it would lead to anything more. That was a sort of idea. But uh, I'm still quite happy, happy with it. The only problem was, of course, cleaning up. But uh, that's why we're playing in the parking lot. But, uh, but the moment I sort of thought that, OK, this, this is kind of working, is that when I saw people sort of picking up the pieces to throw them again. <laughs> Yeah, that's the idea there. Uh, I think the sort of way to expand this idea is that uh, I think we often think about game mechanics as a way to solve problems, design problems. We want the larva to go like this, so we need, we need a mechanic to push it so it goes like that. But the idea here is to make the mechanics sort of inherently worthwhile. So the point is the experience of using that tool. In this case, the cups you destroy. And that is, in a sense, is, is part of the experience. But that also, slight digression here, kind of, kind of like leads to another kind of poetics of what's interesting in a LARP. Because often we talk about stories or we talk about character experiences or something like that, but this is something much simpler. This is just like the feeling when you have it in your hand, you do and it's destroyed. And you, your normal life doesn't allow for that, or for wallowing in flour either. So maybe you need a framework in which you can do that <laughs> in a fun way. So here's another art, uh, art game. It, is, it was an art festival. 2010 uh, staircase, this with Katri Lassila. Here the idea was to kind of uh, the classic problem of LARP is that, I don't know if all of us share, but I have experienced many times, is that here's an art institution that wants to give you money, but they also kind of want that it would not be so insular, that the experience should somehow be more open. And they're not going to give you the money if, if it's closed, like LARP always is. Personally, I believe in this closed stuff. I think this open audience, LARP with audience stuff, I don't like it. But this was a kind of an attempt to bridge this very practical problem of how to deal with an art festival by making a LARP that's like a five minute LARP, like the smallest possible unit of LARP. So there's only one player and one NPC in this LARP. And this LARP works like this. Uh, you walk into the gallery where you meet uh, a person, me, who explains to you what it's about, what's the experience you can have. And the experience is this, you play a character who is on a, like an, uh, who, is go, who is going who is going on, on a date, and this LARP starts with this player playing this character who is going on a date, walking up to a door and knocking on the door, and I tell the player that after that you can be silent, you can talk, you can walk away, you can st you can do anything you like. It will work. You you cannot fuck up this game, and then that person does what they do, and then they walk away and game over. Usually five minutes, 10 minutes, a few times it was, went surprisingly long. And the sort of story of it is that uh, uh, both people in this relationship are uh, like uh, object fetishists. Now, for those of you who don't know, object fetishism is like a kind of a sexual fetish which is directed against, uh, directed towards uh, inanimate objects like well, we have objects all around. I think the like most famous examples are where you fall in love with the, the Eiffel Tower, or you fall in love with the Berlin Wall, these kinds of things. 
And the, the sub subject matter here I thought interesting was that this kind of a fetish is so rare. It's so rare that it's very hard to find somebody who shares this understanding of this sexual thing with you. So if you are in a relationship with, this, with a person who shares this with you, then that's a beautiful thing. So, and there's two characters. The player character is somebody who has lived with this fetish for a long time and understands the value of this shared experience. And the NPC, what happens in the game is that the NPC comes to the door after the knock and says that the relationship is over. We are not going to go on a date and in fact we should never meet again. And the reason the NPC explains is that uh, it's the shame. The NPC feels that, uh, that this is not what they want from their lives, that this is, uh, that this is just too weird. And so of course it's a very sad thing. And that's how it ends. For because for the player character kind of understands already that, uh, that you may throw it away now, but uh, in time you will regret it. That is sort of story. And we had two NPCs, a male and a female, depending on what the player requested for that purpose. But that was a sort of idea here, the, the kind of, uh, that this is our attempt to create uh, fence-related <laughs> pornography. I'm not sure if it's successful. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to do that. It's very hard to do that. But with, we, we wanted to decorate. So you take a camera and you look at the fence and you like, a, okay, okay. I think, you, I, I think you need a photographer who is uh, into it. But basically the idea here is, is, was, was to just create this microscopically small LARP, mini LARP, one scene LARP of one, one thing only. Slightly bigger LARP is uh, 2013, 2016, Halatisar. I was, uh, 2013, I was the lead producer and also wrote some stuff. And uh, on the second run, I was only uh, like a, one of the producers. So I had a smaller role there. And uh, of course created by a much bigger team with uh, with 80 participants, and this is a Palestinian-Finnish co-production where our idea was to sort of create the political experience of how of life in Palestine in, uh, in Finland for uh, Finnish players, Nordic players, and so on. So, you may have noticed we jump scale from very small to very big here. Also, I think this is actually the first really big, or really big, but big LARP that I organized since uh, those teenage vampire things. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this game that, uh, that I think is interesting. There's a free documentation book which you can find at that address as a free downloadable PDF where you can read a lot of stuff about how it, uh, how it worked. And basically the idea of this LARP was that it's set in like a normal day at the University of Helsinki in the occupied Finnish territories. And uh, as the occupying force, we had the invented nation of Euralia, which had been created sort of on top of Finland, as is in real life. Of course, the real life analog is Israel and uh, Palestine. And, uh, One kind of uh, maybe thing that I can mention about this LARP in game action about this LARP is that uh, we really wanted to have this sort of uh, reality of the Palestinian experience represented by actual Palestinians. So we had a half of our production team as Palestinians, and uh, and uh, so we, you have a certain budget. You have, let's say, in our case, thirteen thousand euros you can use to make a LARP. So the question is, what do you do with that money? Do you buy, do you rent a huge castle? Do you get wonderful props for everybody? What, what are you gonna do with that money? In our case, it did not come from, uh, from players or small amount from players, but mostly as a grant, as an arch grant. And uh, what we did it was bought a lot of uh, plane tickets. So we had uh, 10, 12, I think 10 Palestinian players plus maybe four Palestinian organizers who we flew from uh, uh, 
most, most of them from uh, Ramallah to Finland to play in this LARP, and then uh, everything else we did as cheap as we possibly could. But I think that's a question of where you prioritize, where you think that what's, what's important here for, for, the, for the experience. <coughs> Incidentally, if you want to make a very cheaply produced LARP look really nice, the professional tip I can give you is get a very good <laughs> photographer. Yeah. But uh, the one like big idea here I want to underline out of this LARP is like when you make when we make political LARP participatory culture, I think there is a um, kind of a tendency to misunderstand what's what can be understood with this tool. What can, what's real? What's not real? Because when you have experienced something, it really feels real. But the question is, have you experienced a LARP where the experience is created out of your own preconceptions? Or have you experienced something new brought by new information? And this new information approach is much harder. It requires a lot more, a lot more data before the LARP. You need to read stuff. You need to sit in workshop where stuff is explained to you. Maybe not super exciting stuff. And that is, makes it harder approach. And the other thing is to have the people who you are talking about actually part of the LARP in some way. I think we did, we did it in a more extreme way in, in the sense that uh, we had, uh, we, we, we sort of made it, uh, or like a, when I say we, I mean like me as a Finnish LARP designer, I made it with, and other, and other Finns, our team made it with Palestinian designers. I think a Palestinian could stand here and say that, that they made it with Finnish designers. <laughs> so in that sense, it was, uh, it was uh, totally integrated in the project. But I think you don't have to, you can do this in many different ways. But I think that was the sort of, for me, the important thing there. And that also means that you are kind of responsible to, not to some abstract people, so, so like a, if I make a LARP about torture, will some torture victim somewhere in the world possibly offended? Maybe, you don't know. But here the idea is, if I do something stupid, is this guy right here going to be offended? Is this person right here going to be, going to be thinking that I'm making fun of their suffering? Maybe. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being stupid, then yes. And I think that makes, changes the perspective. But that's, oh, there's also a huge upside, and the upside is a certain kind of authenticity. Both during the game, because you can ask people, like, how, so how is it? And also after the game, when people can tell you things that are uh, bring new perspective to the lab experience. For example, after the th 2013 run, one of the uh, Palestinian organizers told me that, uh, that it was very strange for them to watch how the Finnish players like, uh, like rioted, behaved in a riot. Because they thought that these guys don't know how to do it. <laughs> these, guys, these guys suck. I mean, these are like the worst rioters ever. <laughs> but the reason for that is very simple. The reason is that if you live in an environment where you need to learn how to resist, because otherwise it's no life, then you learn how to do it. And then if you come from that environment to a place like Finland where people don't have to learn that, and then you know how to do it, you're looking at a bunch of people who don't know how to do it, and you're going like, wait, why are these guys so... But then you realize, and this was the sort of what uh, Fatima Abdul Karim, our co-designer, said to me, that, uh, that what you realize is that you are the weird one. These are the normal guys. The normal people don't have to know this. Only you who live in such a bad situation, bad political situation, and, and uh, under this oppressive regime, you have to know this, that, that, that it would be better to be like those guys who don't know how to do it. Uh, yeah, this was the other one, the high resolution world. So I think normally when we do a lot of LARP, when you have a lot of space for improvisation, you want big, clear elements that people can really grasp. But the problem is that sometimes when you want to do something nuanced, want to really pick into some kind of a real thing that exists in the world, uh, that kind of very broad co-creative thing is actually doesn't work. Because then you again make things about your own preconceptions in STEMS 2015. The perfect human. 
I think I'm going to go a little bit over time. So this was actually a very simple small art. Here the idea is that we all want these stock photos. Stock photos that look like this. Used to advertise banks, uh, insurance companies, a uh, lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, different things outside in, in this world use stock photos of these successful, happy business people in their blue shirts. They love each other, they smile, they are in these white environments. And um, I started to think that, uh, designed by, uh, with me, by, uh, with Jakob Stenrus, and then the photography stuff that's very integral to this art by Thomas Poikrem. Uh, in this in this, uh, I started to think like, uh, what is the life of these people? <laughs> these happy, joyous, beautiful people. And I think this is, these kind of images are the kind of social realism of our age. These kind of images show us what is the neoliberal perfect human of the title. How, how we should exist in society. And of course, instead of building huge statues in parks as they did in the Soviet Union, we put them in uh, bank advertisements, as befits our age. And uh, here the design is extremely, maybe I could say like brutal. In this LARP, everybody has only one emotion. One emotion, and that emotion is motivated excitement. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Woo! And uh, every interaction is positive. Every interaction is positive. So, like we start the game, and around, I think around the first thing that did happen in the workshop, anyway, is that a couple of the people organized into the Eagle team and the Lion team. This is a consulting agency. Eagle team, Lion team. And the idea is that uh, you don't put your merits on your own board, but on the other guy's board. So you guys like, that was such an excellent idea, I will put it now on your scoreboard. So it's kind of the anti-panoptic orb in this sense. It's supposed to be so supportive. And every idea is, of course, a great idea. It's a wonderful, beautiful idea. And everybody is super excited about your ideas all the time. <laughs> and this game has no real like story. Every character is exactly the same at the start of the game and at the end of the game. Nobody changes in any way at all. Everybody is totally like this from, uh, from start to finish. Uh, the kind of uh, term for <laughs> a very crucial technique we used is no, not from LARP at all, but from the world of uh, cults, real-life religious cults, where it's used in a more sinister way. It's called love bombing. And the way love bombing works is that uh, you get positive affirmation all the fucking time from everybody. Everybody thinks you are the smartest, the most capable, the most interesting, your ideas are beautiful. Everything you say is just so genius. And this is what you do every time, all the time in this lab. And the thing is that it makes you feel good. I mean, it's great. You're the best. Right. But um, I did get com well, we did get comments in the after discussion that, uh, that once the game is over, you feel kind of like... Uh, Weird, dirty maybe even. But during the game, uh, great fun. This lasted for four hours. I'm not sure if you can do it for longer than that because it's very physically, if physically hard to keep that level of like uh, excitement going with no rest, no nothing. So, end of the line. A year ago, and this is uh, Vampire the Masquerade LARP, the first LARP of the new White Wolf. Played uh, in Helsinki and then again in New Orleans. Here, here we had uh, oh, lead designers by me, Jarke Pedersen and Martti Eriksson. And uh, here we had, uh, like I started my LARP with Vampire LARP, so this was a kind of a childhood dream to do this kind of game. But uh, I played a lot of Vampire when I was younger. Also, when I was not so young. And uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I think you kind of disappear into this vampire world. You start to think, instead of thinking about like what the vampire like is, like blood, blood drinking, you start to think about, oh, but the Justicars, and the Anarchs, and the, and the Camarilla, and the Bruja. And if, uh, at some point, you kind of disappear into this world of these, uh, these types. And what the goal here was to really just go as much back to basics 
as possible in any, any way. So the idea was that this is the vampire LARP with vampire in it. Now that sounds very obvious, but, uh, but it leads to a lot of design things. The sort of uh, setting, of the setting of the LARP is, uh, is a techno party, an illegal techno party. And uh, like when you start to think about what vampires need to vampire, to be vampires, they need to hunt. Who are they hunting? They hunt people, so you need a lot of people in this LARP. So you need human characters, maybe. A lot of human, a lot, tons of human characters. Then you think about vampire teams. Maybe, in fact, not only the vampires can follow the vampire teams, maybe everybody can do the vampire teams. Everybody can be predator and prey, changes again things into a different way. And then, of course, there's kind of a rules mechanics that are often used in vampire LARP, but are those the ones that create the best experience for this specific LARP? Then, no. So a new, new kind of mechanics that specifically direct people to do those things in the dynamic of the game. But, uh, and of course, like a key idea <laughs> was just to make a, make a, make a, like a, like a vampire LARP, which is, which looks, looks, uh, looks real in a sense. It looks like the thing it's supposed to be. Uh, and that is actually the kind of design idea I wanted to pick from here. This was a discussion we had, uh, like a, when we've been, for example, asked that if could we take this LARP to some place, to some city, like what, what does it need to be produced? And the answer is that you kind of need the, exactly the same things you would need to produce a real techno party of this type. Because as a physical event, they are almost identical. What you need is a dance floor. What you need is a space that's sort of complicated and interesting enough to be, to have like nooks and crannies where people can be. But also I think maybe that's something you might want for your real party too. And uh, you need a DJ, you need somebody to play the music, you need the equipment for that. And uh, at some point you start to think that, is, but is, what's is the difference here? Like uh, we are pretending to be people at the techno party here at this techno party. <laughs> And well, of course, the difference is that there's vampires in there, but uh, and everybody has alibi to be predator and prey both. But that was the sort of idea: is that uh, there are like some experiences, and in a sense, this is kind of similar to the both the flower stuff and the plastic cup or the ceramic cup breaking stuff. Is that uh, it's more about giving you an environment where you don't necessarily go, or a perspective you don't necessarily have in your everyday life, and then just doing it for like as close to real as possible. Because when you are in end of the line, when you are dancing to the music, like uh, there's no pretend there. It, it, it is real in that sense. The bloodletting, less so. And uh, as the final thing is the flower I'm working on right now, which is uh, Enlightenment in Blood, part of the World of Darkness Berlin event. You can get a ticket right now if you want to, with your cell phone. Uh, gonna be in May in Berlin. It's gonna be the first night of the Anarch Revolution. And I'm just gonna say that I made a lot of art lab stuff like that, but if the 16-year-old me or 15-year-old me who lied his age to get into vampire lab could see this now, would be very happy. Yeah, but this lab also has one I think probably the biggest new idea here is goes back to that uh, thing I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, presentation. I mentioned the random generated vampire LARP and the LARP vamp and the sequel which we never got made. I'm not going to say that this is the sequel because that would be stupid, but some of that thinking is here. Basically what we are trying to do here, and I really hope it works, I think it will, is that uh, when I get a character, to any LARP. I look at it and I think, oh, this is great stuff, uh, this is not so great. Okay, I will leave that out, I will use that. Um, okay, this I have to rethink a little bit, but it's gonna be fine. That's sort of my experience normally with basically any character. And I think this is probably shared by many people. The idea here is that uh, what you instead use is a tool, software tool, so you go on a website 
and you start our website, and you start creating a character from pieces that we provide. You get choices. It's sort of like uh, when you start playing, let's say, Mass Effect. In Mass Effect, you start by creating a character, but the choices you make are related to what kind of powers you will have, things like that. Here, of course, we focus on personality, on motivations, and on sort of where you are located in the life. And the idea here is that you get that power for yourself as a, as a player. So what I'm going for with this thing in Enlightenment in the Blood is this is sort of efficiency of character. That when you look at the things that are in your character, every single thing in there is like, this is what I want to be doing in this LARP. Because you have made that choice yourself out of a selection of things. And then all of those things together create a character or some kind of like an image that you will then make into a character. And of course this has uh, another side, which is that uh, it means that it you also, or we have to, or I have to even, rethink how characters are written, because what this means is that, uh, is that a character is not, under this kind of a system, is not a, a role, like Hamlet is a role. I'm playing Hamlet. Have I portrayed Hamlet faithfully? Is my Hamlet interesting? Did I fuck up my Hamlet? Here, that kind of a question is not something you can really ask, because you created your own thing, and your thing is the way you do it, and you're not really responsible to anybody about how exactly do you express that thing. It's your thing. Nobody can tell you that, uh, yeah, no, not like that. And that, I think, will give people, or I hope will give people, a kind of uh, better feeling of uh, ownership and uh, sort of empowerment to do with the character what they really want to do to access the game as much as they can. Okay, that was the end of it. Thank you.